listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome into the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Thank you guys so much for being part of this show and the Hazard Ground community. I want to again remind you about our Amazon promotion that you guys have done such an amazing job on. We have been able to make another donation to a charity featured here on the Hazard Ground Podcast. This time it was the Pat Tillman Memorial Foundation. Again, all you got to do is go to hazardground.com, click on the Sponsors tab, or go to the bottom of the homepage, click on that Amazon button, and you can go do your normal Amazon shopping as you always do. We get a percentage of whatever you spend, and then we take that money and we donate it right back to some of the amazing charities you've heard here on the Hazard Ground. So you guys are directly impacting veterans' lives just by listening to the Hazard Ground and just by going to hazardground.com and doing your normal Amazon shopping. So again, thank you so much for that. Don't forget to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Keep up with the show, everything we have going on. We've got a lot of great guests coming up, guys. You're going to be really excited about what we have going forward as we head into this coming fall. And also spread the word of the Hazard Ground. Tell a friend, share the podcast with people that you know. We love to keep continuing to grow this audience, and you guys are a big part of that. So thanks for out of the way, and all the homework is out of the way, and now on to this week's episode. Joining us now is a former United States Army E-5 sergeant who served in Vietnam, and after 11 months of a 12 months tour, he was wounded and left paralyzed from the legs down. He was also named the National Commander of the Disabled American Veterans and he still today works to advocate for veterans in his home state of South Dakota. He is Gene Murphy joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Gene, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. It's my pleasure to be here with you. Gene, certainly going to spend some time talking about the disabled American veterans and earning that post as the national commander. Certainly an amazing honor after all that you went through. But I want to go back to the beginning for you because you ended up in the Army at a time where not a lot of people wanted to end up in the army because you were drafted into Vietnam. So tell me that story. How did it all happen for you? You know, I was, I, I received greetings. I went to college a year and, and started the uh, next semester. And then I stayed out the, the fall semester and I got greetings from uh, the president, mm-hmm. but it was my honor to serve. I mean, I, I come from a family that, uh, uh, that um, many veterans, my father was a World War II vet and, um, I have four brothers, and actually four of us served during the Vietnam era, and three of us went over there. So just for everyone's clarifications, when you say greetings, what do you mean, greetings from the president? Oh, I got greetings from the president. Like you, you, know, met, he, you met him? No, no, no. He wanted my services as a draftee. Ah, okay, gotcha. What's that like? I mean, ever did you see a lot of friends at that time getting drafted in the Army? Were you nervous? Were you scared? No, I wasn't really scared. I mean, um, I guess my father raised us, um, you know, very patriotic. And, uh, um, I, you know, I mean, from being a, a Boy Scout, uh, you know, to help put the flags on the graves, um, you know, during uh, during Memorial Day and then going to services with my father, you know, from Memorial and Veterans Day and the different things in the community. Um I come from a small uh, small town of only 450. That farm community actually sent 38 guys to Vietnam. So, so I mean, it was, uh, again, uh, we were raised, um, I guess we were raised, hey, there's no free lunch and you've got to serve your country. All right, so you find out you're going to Vietnam, What's ne- or you find out rather that you're getting drafted. What's next for you? Give me, tell, Take me through the process. Well, I mean, and I went, actually went down to the draft board to see where I sat because I was going to go back to college. And uh, again, uh, the young lady said, L- let me check your name and came back and she said, you'll be getting greetings tomorrow. And I actually had a buddy that just had returned from Vietnam. And uh, so we went out and had a couple of beers. And, uh, and, and of course, um, I guess I wasn't really scared. I went to boot camp up at Fort Lewis. Um I met, actually met a, uh, a, another guy from that lived about 45 miles from my hometown. Lyle Bose is his name. And uh, we went to boot camp together, and then we went to advanced training as mortarmen, uh, 81 millimeter and a 4.2-inch uh, gun. 
And uh, we figured we'd be separated af- after that, and we ended up taking the same plane to Vietnam. We thought we'd be at a, a fire support base or base camp, uh, you know, in Vietnam. So uh, I guess we thought things would be um, maybe a little safer than the jungle or the bush. Uh, again, before we left, my my oldest brother was a he was medical service corps. He was a first lieutenant. He had orders also, and my father took us to a side, and he didn't want us both going. And uh, he said, I can't pick or choose who's going to go, but I want one of you to stay back in the States. And and I told my oldest brother, he was married and had two young kids, and I said, you know, stay in the States. And he said, no. He said, you're going to be in the bush or you're going to be in the jungle. And I kept saying, no, I'm a motorman. I'm going to be again, at a base camp, and uh, and we just both went. I mean, uh, uh, and again, there's Lyle Bowes. Uh, we took the same flight over, this buddy of mine, and uh, got assigned to the same same outfit, first of the 12th, 4th ID, Charlie Company. And, uh, you know, we I, I guess, um, you know, when we first got there, I'm still thinking we're going to be at a base camp, and all of a sudden, uh, when we went up to the 4th ID up at Play Coup, at Campanari, this E seven welcomed us to Vietnam and said you're all infantry. <laughs> and I'm thinking I'm <laughs> hey, not good. I'm the only guy raised my hand. I said there's been a hell of a mistake here, so I said you can correct this error. And uh, and uh, we, of course I told him we were eleven Charlie, and he said uh, don't worry, young fella. So I'm thinking he's listening. And then the next words were you will learn real quick, and wow. that's when my yeah, my buddy Bode leaned over and he said, I think we're in deep shit. Yeah. <laughs> Gene, hold on no, a second. To- Hang on, because you, you, you unpacked a lot there. I, I want to go back to a couple of things real quick. One, uh-huh. you, you said that you your friend had just got back from Vietnam right after you were drafted. You went out and had a beer with him. Did you talk? Did he talk to you about his experience? What did he tell you? Oh, yeah. He, he told me some of the stuff. His name was Ed Smith. And the Smith boys, there was, I think, about seven of them boys. And I think about... I'm thinking four of them went over to uh, Southeast Asia, you know. So, uh, yeah, he would tell me some of this stuff. And, yeah, I was a little scared, but now I'm still thinking we're not going to be in the jungle. So I thought this will be okay yet. Okay, so in that conversation, though, did he give you an idea of any of the jungle, any of the temperatures, the environment, or did he just kind of gloss over it all? Well, he gave it, yeah, he gave it, I mean, he said it was, you know, really hot at times. Um, he said the jungle was very thick, you know, and of course, I'm a young kid at 19, and I'm thinking, well, it can't be that bad, and, um, you know, and that's my father fought in the jungles in New Guinea, and again, he was trying to tell us what the jungle was like, uh, and, and I even questioned him, and, and he, he gave me hell, because he said, you don't understand, you know, so... You know, and you were, you, I guess I always think we were young and naive, and, uh, and we didn't really know what we were getting ourselves into. And then go back to that conversation with your father and your brother, where your father says, I want one of you to stay. Um, I, I, I just, I'm envisioning that, and, and as a parent now uh, of two boys, and I'm sitting here thinking, well, what would, how, how do I even have that conversation with my kids? I mean, you know, how do you, I get your dad saying, I can't choose, but leaving it up to the two of you is almost like who wants to almost sign their own death sentence? You know, it's just it, that conver- I'm trying to wrap my head around how that goes. Do you remember that conversation? Well, Oh well, yeah. Cause I mean, and my dad was straightforward. He was, I mean, uh, um, you know, he was real serious cause, uh, cause he'd seen war. I mean, yet, um, he, he was wounded in New Guinea, uh, actually twice. And, uh, you know, and, but again, you're young. I mean, you. Yeah, at times, I think you're invisible. Um, yeah. So I mean, he was real serious, and and I guess uh, as a 19 year old kid, I I didn't take it that serious. Um, and and again, sometimes I'm thinking, even as an older veteran, he's telling us, you know, how bad it was, and you're thinking, boy, was it was it really that bad, or or uh, is he really? Is he really trying to scare you? I mean, so you both ended up going, which I understand, but was there any kind of, you know, was your dad okay when you both went? Did, he, did Was he upset that you both had to go? I mean, when he found out you Oh, both- he accepted that, but he was real. I could see 
after, I guess, after as you age and stuff, I could see his concerns. You know, I mean, it would be real hard. Like you, you've got two sons. Boy, it would be, and I have just a daughter. We have a daughter, but boy, it would be real hard for me to send a, a son or daughter off to war. I mean, right. I get, uh, and, and I can give you an example. My my buddy, this Lyle Bose, who I always say the good Lord and him saved my life. Uh, his son, when we came, you know, and and, and this was in the in the nineties. His son uh, enlisted in the Marine Corps. And, of course, uh, I found out, and, and I called him up, and we had some words of wisdom. <laughs> and and uh, I wasn't real happy because I'm thinking, jeepers, what we went through and, and, and you know, this Persian Gulf, uh, right. the Gulf War just break out. And what, what are you doing letting your son go in the Marine Corps and what we went through in the jungles? You know, and I guess I always thought of the, the – you know, in the Gulf, they were going to square away in the desert, and there's no place to hide, and they're just going to, uh, you know, they built Hussein's guard up to be the elite, you know, seals or rangers, and I'm thinking they're going to square away, and they're going to kill each other. Uh, I mean, that was, you know, so, and again, I apologize to him after I chewed him out. So. <laughs> Okay, uh, amazing stuff. Let's get back to you get on a plane, you end up in Vietnam, you, you're thinking you're going to be a mortar man, you're going to be fairly safe, and uh, Sergeant First Class tells you, hey, you're now infantry. And as you said, you're in a world of you know what. Uh, what happens next? Yeah, because, I mean, we, we ended up going to the jungle, or we had like maybe three days of training and sighted in our rifles, and uh, we went to the jungle, and I still remember getting out there, I mean, we landed on a bird or a chopper, and, and as I looked up the hill, you could see the two ponchos together. Uh, you know, I mean, they didn't even give us a tent. They gave us a, each a poncho and a poncho liner. And uh, and then all of a sudden, these guys came out of the bamboo thicket, and they looked like they hadn't they hadn't have a uh, they hadn't bathed in probably uh, you know thirty days. And I'm thinking, boy, these guys look dirty, and yet. And as we and again as we're getting off the off the bird, the Bo said again, I think we're really we're really in deep shit now. He says, you know, and I'm looking around and I'm thinking, boy, what did we get into? And of course, we're assigned uh, different squads. I was um, I was assigned to the third platoon, second squad, and he was assigned to the second platoon, uh, second squad, and. Uh, and within a week, um, all of a sudden, my first squad leader, Barney Kahn from, and I'm thinking he was from Mississippi, he said, I'm going on a, you're going with Loveless on a four-man LERP team. And I said, okay, four men, what what the, what's a LERP? And he said, well, it's a long-range reconnaissance patrol. And, and right away, I'm thinking, boy, four guys, you probably just go out, you know, just for one day, go out in the morning, come back towards evening. And I even asked him, I said, you just go out one day? And he said, no, man. He said, you go out at least four days. And I'm thinking with four guys? He said, oh, don't worry. Loveless will break in. You know, and I'm thinking, oh, we're, we're in trouble here. Four guys. And, uh, and looking back, um, and I ran, we ran many uh, four-man LERP teams. And I guess I felt we had an advantage because we grew up in the Midwest. And, I mean, as a kid uh, with five boys in my family, I mean, we camped out, we fished, we hunted, uh, you know. So I always thought we had advantage to them individuals such as yourself in New York or California. Why? Why would you have the advantage? Because we camped out before shotguns. I mean, we're, you know, we're that individual. I mean, I met one kid from California that the only time he'd handled a weapon was when he went in the Army. Wow. You know, where we... I mean, we, we hunted pheasants, we hunted uh, ducks, uh, deer, you know, uh, so it was, um, yeah, so I always thought we had an advantage such as, uh, you know, I can remember being in the jungle and you could hear the birds on a four-man lure team, you'd hear them, and then all of a sudden they'd disappear, and I'd always tell my guys, and, and I'd motion to them, hey, we're going to take five minutes, we're going to zip up, and we're going to listen, you know, and just to see, why, hey, why did these birds disappear on us? You know, is there is there somebody in this area that shouldn't be? Uh, you know, I mean, I always felt that was, I mean, different things like that. And, of course, camping out. I mean, you know, and again, we camped out for, I mean, I camped out just about 11 months straight. And I think we, we only got back twice to our big base camper called Campanari up at Pleiku. Okay, so 
you actually get through what ninety percent of your entire tour, correct? Before you get wounded. Oh yeah, I'm yeah because I'm down to thirty. 30 some days left before I was wounded. Right. Okay. Well, before we get to that part, day to day life there, I mean, how much combat are you actually seeing? Well, I mean, they always said we've seen a lot more than the World War II vets. I mean, we were in the jungle, the Central Islands, to me, was hilly mountainous. Um, we went north as far as Dock Toe, and we went south all the way down to uh, Bamatui, was more flat land. But uh, but we were up and down the border, the Cambodian border, and just um, uh, again, I mean, day to day life. I mean, you we ran a lot of uh, four man lurk teams, you know, night ambushes, uh, platoon size sweeps, um, search and destroy missions, um, and it, I mean, and I guess to me it was it was hot and it was like uh, three layers of canopy. Um, you'd get hopefully resupplied every third or fourth day with sea, uh, sea, sea rations, you know, and if you needed, you know, from ammo to, um, every 30 days we'd get clean clothes. So we'd actually, our main source of water was mainly a stream or a, a, a river. I mean, and wow. some of us, some of the streams were real fresh because they were spring fed, but, but others weren't. And, and again, you would get from your water out of them to you would wash your clothes and you only have one set of clothes that's the ones you wear um that was the thing whatever you owned you carried so uh you know with nothing to carry uh with your ammo and your claymore mine a pick shovel a machete uh you'd probably carry anywhere from uh, 60 to 80 pounds easy um yeah, it wasn't. I mean, as you look back, I, and again, I think that's why they send the young, the young, uh, the young troops to war, because probably the old guys would say, "Hey, I don't like this. Send me back to base camp." <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, you know, and, and and I guess I look back. I mean, we had monsoons for roughly three months. You know, where you're wet every day. Um, uh, and it seems like I could never, my father would actually drive 70 miles uh, from that little town to the big city of Sioux Falls to the Army surplus store and send, he'd usually send me six pair of socks every month. Oh, wow. we, we could we could never get socks, or and I'd always uh, put a new pair on and keep a pair and give the other four to my buddies. Um, Crazy, you know, they, they could get, get your cigarettes in the drop of a dime, but they couldn't get your socks. Yeah, you know, and that was the thing. I mean, I can still remember, I call them SPs, where we'd get a big garbage sack full of cigarettes and, you know, candy bars and gum and toothpaste and shaving lotion, razors. Um, uh, you know, and I wasn't a smoker, and actually I wouldn't I wouldn't even let my guys smoke on the four-man LERP teams because of this. I always had the discipline of not only noise discipline but smell. So I didn't, I mean, because there was a couple times we actually – we would have ran right into them, but prior we could actually smell them because they were smoking. Gotcha. Yeah, so I mean, yeah, so I always look at the, um, none of us wore any rank. I mean, not only the, I call him the old man, the captain, uh, my lieutenant, um, myself as a sergeant. I mean, there was no rank, no name tag, uh, you know, in your uniform. Uh, again, I guess you could say we were all green in the jungle. Right. Um, yeah. So let um, me ask you, I mean, you know, you go through 11 months of your tour, but obviously guys are getting wounded and killed along the way. How quickly does that happen and what does it do to you? Well, you get, I mean, you know, and we, uh, I was with just, uh, I was just with my, uh, my buddy, it is Lyle Bowes. I was up right. at his, uh, uh, his home up in Brookings, um, matter of fact, this weekend. And uh, and we talked. We lost like 220 guys the year he made it the whole 12 months. And and um, sometimes I think you get numb. Um, you don't want to get close to any of the new guys. You know, and I was close to some of the guys. Or um, um, it just uh, you know because as as you go through the rank as a sergeant, I didn't want to get any of my guys hurt. Um, I walk point a lot because I didn't want to have to pick a guy to, to walk point. Um, uh, 
Um, I had one kid, he'd walk point, uh, he'd volunteer every time if I asked him, and uh, and uh, Gary Grubbs, and he was from California, and uh, he was wounded in February of 69, and, and actually volunteered to come back because he thought we needed him, and uh, he was killed in May, and I always, I think of him often, um, you know, because I think what what would have he been? Could he have been a famous doctor, uh, inventor, uh, you know, and so forth? His face never gets old because he was only nineteen. You know, so yeah, you get to the point where you get numb, but um, and then after say a big battle, you could actually smell the, I say, smell the blood, the carnage. Um, and and you'd actually probably even get the shakes a little where you think, you know, how did we survive? You know, the guy next to me got got killed, but I survived. I mean, um, and you went forward. I mean, just... Um, uh, but did you ever you have know, those you, conversations with your buddy Lyle, who you've spoken of so fondly and you still know? Did you ever look at him one night and just turn around and say, man, we're not going to get out of here alive? Well, I always thought we'd get out alive. I always, I was a firm believer, and I think he was too. Because, and you know, and it just seems like as we went through that that twelve months, you know, at at last I got invisible, and probably somebody should have took a bat and hit me right in the head. I mean, I we've had burn, you know, the they shoot red tracers, and I've also seen green ones, and I've had them hit the tree I'm hiding behind or right in front of the foxhole I'm in. And, I mean, they just, I mean, uh, uh, the heart is beating, um, you know. So I don't know if, I mean, and Lyle knew that too. And, and at times when we'd get into battles, uh, I'd have to listen because his squad was on point and I was, my squad was in the rear and I'd always tell the lieutenant, Let, let's go up and help him. No, he said, just stay stay down, you know. And and he would do the same. I remember one day, and he brought that up, um, I fact, this weekend, that uh, he listened for like six hours that a battle that we were in on the side of a hill, and uh, and um, and I was involved in it, uh, and that was in February, and that's when Groves was wounded, or um, Robillard's squad got, I mean, the, the nine of them, he was the only one left. And he's yelling on the horn that all of his guys are down, and and I take two guys with me, two volunteers, and that was Grubbs and and Chastain, and and both them got wounded in that six hour battle, and we couldn't find two guys, we couldn't find Hogan, Kilbane, and and uh, Robillard and myself found Hogan, drug him back, and we couldn't find Kilbane, and and he was killed that day, or that, and we found him, and we'd never leave our wounded behind, you know, our wounded or dead. I mean, we just uh. That was our policy, you know, so whatever it took, we'd, you know, make sure they got out. It's amazing. So I don't want to ask such a vague question or a general question, but I'm just kind of curious what stands out. Like, is there something that's particularly gruesome or something that's particularly, I guess, evil that you saw that, that stays with you? Because 11 months in Vietnam – I mean, honestly, like after being deployed to Iraq twice, I'm sitting here going, I would never want to go to Vietnam. Like it was just an entirely different tempo, an entirely different life. And so I'm just curious, you know, between everything that you went through and everything that you saw, what stands out the most? Well, what stands out the most? Well, I guess maybe that friendship that Bose and I, um, you know, I mean, that, 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 um, you know, because I didn't know him prior to going in the military, but that that friendship or that brotherhood that uh, connects us to this day that, um, that you know, that uh, I have four brothers, and you could probably call him an, um, actually a brother. So I have five brothers. Um, that closeness, I mean, and an and example, the day I was shot up, we were, um, we ended up uh, running into... Now, they said a, a whole bunch of NVA, and they, they actually said 800 of them. Now, was there 800? Hell if I know, but I know there was a lot of them. I mean, it, well, and and, uh, and we shot one, and one got away, and we were actually tracking him, and I was on point and probably shouldn't have been. I got in an argument with my lieutenant because uh, first he said, Murph, you don't have to go, and I said, no, you're taking half my men. I'm going to go with them. 
And, and then he actually gave me orders twice that that's an order you're not going. And of course we, we had words and, and, uh, we went and I was the first one shot up and, uh, and then my platoon sergeant Lightfoot got hit. Um, but Bose was one of the first guys to me and he carried me about 400 meters and, and, uh, and and then we tried to get a bird in, or uh, you know we didn't have an LZ or landing zone to put the bird in, so they hovered on on top of the trees. And I can still remember the the captain; he's yelling in the horn. I got seven down, two of them aren't going to make it. And and I'm thinking, how long can the bird? You know, how long can they hold? Because the NVA are just, I mean, they're shooting the hell out of him. I mean, they're dinging him bad. And all of a sudden, I can hear them, the, the, one of the pilots saying, hey, it's too, it's too hot, too hot of LZ. We got to abort the mission. And, and I can hear, you know, they lift it off. Well, Bose right away dug me a hole for the night because we thought we'd get overrun. And, uh, you know, and I mean, that closeness, uh, and he laid beside me the whole night. I, I still give him, uh, I still have words with him because he wouldn't give me any water. He'd give me uh, just a cap of the canteen. Um, because I had, I got shot tw- twice through the right side and once through the right leg and, and I had gut wounds. So he knew that he couldn't give me a lot of water, but I mean, that closeness were, I mean, and then we ran out of morphine about two in the morning. So he actually told me just, you know, just grab his arm or his shoulder when the pain was so bad. And, uh. You know, so I mean, I guess I look at that closeness. Uh, uh, the other thing, I look at some of the guys that were shot up. Some of them were shot up so bad that you think, no way, are we even going to get this guy on the bird? And and uh, and he lived. And and then I've seen other guys. And uh, Jerry Warburton was shot through the knee, and within an hour died on us. And he, he went into shock. I mean, I actually slapped him trying to bring him out of the. Sh- out of that, you know, that, I guess, shock and just, so you always think that will, that also the will to live, you know, and, and I know when I initially got shot, I thought I was going to die because I seen the people float above me and it was just their faces now. And my grandmother had just died and it seemed like they floated and floated and floated and <laughs> was probably seconds. And, and I even told the Lord, Hey, I'm not ready yet. And there, there's things I want to do. And, and I guess I always think we made a pact that night. He, he's gonna, he said, we're going to let you live, Sergeant Murphy, but you got to do some work when you get home. So that's why I've been so involved with the, uh, with the disabled American veterans. Wow. Okay, let's uh, kind of back up a little bit because uh, about the day uh-huh. you, you got shot. So you have words with the, your lieutenant. Um, do you look back on that and wish you had listened to him? Well, uh, you know, because uh, again, whoever is going to walk point, I mean, they're putting themselves in that position. Uh, my lieutenant lost a leg that day. He got shot eight times in both legs. And just, um, you know, I mean, you know, what have I made it out? I can, I mean, if, if, I, I never, I guess I never really say if, if this happened. Well, hey, this is, this is the predicament that I'm in and I'm going to move forward. I mean, uh, uh, and I can give you an example. Uh, 27 days after I was wounded, uh, they walked into a horseshoe ambush, and they were down to eight, 88 guys. We should have been 140. We were on the average of 100. Well, that time they were down to 88, and I think they had 12 dead and, and, and 56 wounded. Well, what if I, two of my guys, or just Gary Grubbs got killed that day. So I'm always thinking, well, what, if, if, I mean, say if, if. it wasn't that day, it might have been another day, right? Yeah, it might have been another day, but I guess, but, but again, at last, I think you get invisible. I always say the first 45 days you could get hit because you don't know nothing. And the last 45 days is a bad time because you get overconfident and you get invisible. You know, so, I mean, that's, yeah, so, I mean, and, hey, I look back at, I mean, hey, I'm, I mean, hey, I've had a super life. Life's been, I always say now life is easy. You know, I, I, Every every day I get up, I get clean clothes, I get a hot shower, I get a little food to eat, and and, uh, and usually one can of pop, and uh, you know, and again I didn't have to dig a bunker last night, cut a field of fire, and there's nobody shooting at me. So so you got to say life is good. <laughs> right. Um, you get hit. 
when you get hit immediately, do you know the extent of your wounds or you don't know at this point? No, I don't know. I know right away because I would tell him the medic or Doc McCarthy, um, and he kept yelling at me, I'm coming, Murph. And I told him, Doc, stay away from me. They got me, the, the guy had me zeroed in, and I, had, I didn't want him hit. And I told him, I said, I can't feel my legs. And I right away, I, I actually thought my, uh, I thought my legs were blown off, and I touched my thighs. And then I just lifted my head just to see the tips of my boots and, uh, again, the guy popped out of a hole, and he seen me, and he, he shot another 30-round burst. That's when I got shot in the, right above the right ankle. And you could see the, the bullets coming up all the right leg, you know, and then I ended up trying to crawl out. Um, but, again, I didn't know the, the level. That was even, you know, a, a day later I woke up in the hospital after the surgery, and they had me on a striker frame, which to me is a, a small bed that's probably 16 inches wide, and they put a uh, every two hours they put a lid on the top of you or at the bottom of you, and they flip you like a rotisserie, right? <laughs> so you don't, yeah, so you don't get any bed sores. And now I've never spent a day in the hospital in my life, and I wake up, and and I'm in this contraption. And I told the nurse, I said, "Can't they afford a regular bed? What is this contraption?" And, of course, she said, uh, Sergeant, the doctor's going to come and talk to you in a couple of minutes, you know. And we're going to flip you in about two minutes also. And I said, what do you mean, flip me? And uh, she said, well, we're going to put a lid on top of you, and we're going to turn you like a rotisserie. And, of course, I'm looking at my arms, and i got tubes all over. And I said, with all these tubes? Yeah, they go with you. Don't worry. And I'm thinking, boy, this is something. I mean, you know, and I didn't know. And that's the doctor and the chaplain came over and told me that, you know, that I was paralyzed and, and I wouldn't wouldn't walk again. Of course, I was angry. I, I think I told them in, in so many words to get get away from me. Or, and, uh, but then, uh, again, but every hospital I was in, and I was in four different ones, there was all, always somebody worse than Sergeant Murphy. Right. You know, I had... Mm-hmm. Um, I had one guy that was a... He was a quadriplegic, Charlie Fratford, he was, um, we actually built him a table because we get two beers at night and, and I'd open one beer and put a long straw in his mouth. And and I remember the first time we did that. And then he said, Murph, light me up a cigarette. And I said, I don't smoke. He said, I, he said that doesn't matter. He said, I do light the cigarette. <laughs> but I held him the cigarette. I mean, yeah, so I look back and, you know, I've got three buddies that are triple amps. I mean, yeah, so I mean, uh, you know, and I guess, I, you know, I, I look back at my injury and it could have been a lot worse. I mean, I couldn't, you know, you could be on the wall and, you know, I got, again, 12 buddies on the wall that, uh, you know, that I, I guess I look back and I always think that should they all be there or should there even be a wall? I mean, I guess I get angry at times at the government because, again, we were just numbers, I always thought. Yes. Uh, you know, I didn't probably think that over when I was there, but I guess. I look back at it now, and we were numbers. Uh, you know, I, 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 some people glorify war, and I think war is very ugly. Um, and again, that, you know, and it would be real hard to to send a son or daughter off. And I and I've talked to other Vietnam vets that feel the same way. Yeah, no, I mean we've we've had a bunch of vets on the podcast, uh, Vietnam ones, and. They all uh, kind of echo the same sentiment. For those who aren't familiar, the wall you're talking about is the Vietnam Wall in Washington yeah, D.C. Vietnam. Yeah. So, um, yeah. Let, let's go back again. So, you say that the the helicopter comes in. It's hovering to come and get you after you've been wounded. Now that helicopter well, about two hours. Okay, yeah. so you waited for two hours. It finally gets there, and then when it takes off without you, are you feeling this sense of like doom? Like this is it? I'm going to die here? No, I, I was. I was. Uh... I was always positive that that Sergeant Murphy was going to make it out of the jungle, um, you know. And I guess I was concerned that that I wouldn't bleed to death, you know, internally, right? You know, because I didn't know how bad my wounds were yet, um, you know. And I didn't even know I was hit in the right, you know, right above the right ankle because I could, I didn't feel it. Gotcha. You know. So yeah. Lyle digs this trench for you, and you're laying in this thing, and you and you stay there throughout the night, throughout the entire night. Yeah, throughout the entire night, and he laid right be right beside me and, and tried to help me out and stuff. So, 
what is he telling you? Like he's digging this trench or he's just saying, hey, Murph, we're going to stay here tonight. You're going to lay here until somebody comes to get you and I'm going to stay with you? No, I knew, I knew, I knew as soon as the bird left off that we'd be there the whole night, you know, and, and they kept bringing in illumination rounds and, and our, and red leg or artillery, um, you know, so, I mean, I just was hoping that, you know, that we didn't get overrun or anything, you know, uh, mm-hmm. how you many know, guys, were, how many guys were with you there staying overnight? Well, we, there were probably 90 of us. Oh, okay. So it was the, the entire platoon. Yeah, the, the the company size element, and okay. just, uh, you know, and and I remember, but it was after two o'clock when my lieutenant, uh, we ran out of morphine, so my lieutenant was starting to scream, and 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 the guy that died, uh, and he was one of our new guys, and, and uh, he was starting to scream. He he actually had gut wounds, and and they're, I mean, real painful. Um, you know, and I actually told Bo, we put a sock in their mouth. They're gonna, they're giving our position away. You know, so I'm still, I'm scared. You know that we're gonna, uh, that we're gonna end up over. You know, getting overrun, and, and that's even the first time in. Uh, we actually got to meet the chopper pilot uh, last year at our state fair, uh, John Conley, and he actually was from South Dakota, grew up in Custer, and he was a crop duster out of the Mitchell area. And so Lyle and I got to meet him uh, uh, during a ceremony up at the uh, our state fair in August, and uh, and the three of us were presented with a uh, with a distinguished service award for our service in Vietnam, and um, yeah, and he said the first time in he was trying to get us out, and and uh, they took something when they got back to camp that night they counted the bullet holes and they. They had, I think it was like 365 bullet holes in the bird. Wow. So I'm always, how did the bird even fly? And and then for 49 years, I've always wondered because the second time in, the next morning when they came in to get us, uh, they got my, the, the head medic said, take the worst guys, take Sergeant Murphy and Lieutenant White. And they took me up. And again, you're in a basket. You're, you're spinning through the you know, through the canopy or the jungle uh, trees. or And uh, they got the lieutenant up, and John says, I look back, and he said, the second guy up, Murph, was, his pants were all blood. And I said, well, they should have been. He was shot eight times in both legs. and uh, But they took off, and for 49 years, I've wondered why they didn't wait for, the, they were going to wait for the other four guys. They were going to get six wounded on, and I knew they'd have to, uh, they'd have to carry the guy that died They'd have to carry him until they got to a secure clearing. But they took off right away, and I'm always wondered why. And what happened is they took more rounds through the bird. So they ended up, you know, sending another helicopter in and tried to get better security of that area. So, uh, but I've wondered for 49 years, hey, why didn't they wait for my four other guys? And, and that was why, which I didn't know. Wow. So that, uh, so when you were laying there next to Lyle, what are you saying to each other? What's he saying to you? Or is it just quiet? I mean, are you dozing in and out of consciousness? What's going on? Well, we're pretty quiet, but then we're also, um, I don't, neither one of us slept the whole night. You know, because I guess, I think Lyle felt the same as me. If I closed my eyes, you know, would I? You might not wake would up. I, yeah, I would never wake up. I mean, get, um, you know, so, I mean, we talk some. You know, and, uh, you know, I mean, but we didn't talk a lot. I mean, I asked him for water because I was so, was so thirsty. And he, again, just give me the cap of the canteen to wet my lips. Um, and actually, the next morning, he wanted to make sure I was the first guy on the bird, the, the medevac chopper out. He was talking to the head medic, and I found a rucksack. We still argue to this day. I found a rucksack with, and I knew I had a quart of wheat. We usually carry four quarts of water, and I knew I had one quart left. Water was priceless, and so so I grabbed that that rucksack and found that canteen. Drank just about the whole. I think I drank the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, after he gets me on the bird, he feels relieved that hey, I got Murph out. You know, I can go back and and have a drink of water because he would he didn't want to drink in front of me either. He said, <laughs> "Well, he comes back and hey." There's no water, and he's thinking, who in the hell stole the water? You know, 
<laughs> yeah, so he's always, and he didn't know until he got back in June of uh, of uh, '69. He came out to Fitzsimmons Army Hospital in Denver and and actually spent a week with me, and uh, and that issue came up, and I said, "Bose, I drank the water." He said, "You drank it." <laughs> yeah. So that, uh, and we were on the same orders uh, to go to Germany uh, after Vietnam. And uh, and he actually, he said, I'll be back the last day of my leave to see me in the hospital. And uh, again, at Fitzsimmons, he came back and he said, I'm not going to Germany. And I said, what do you mean you're not going? He said, I can do more for you right here uh, than I can in, in Germany. I said, the only infantry guys are laying in these beds. He said, I can guard the gate out front. I said, you're not an MP. He said, they can make me an MP. He said, you know, when we went to Vietnam, we weren't infantry. They made us infantry. Now they can make me an MP. Well, he actually flew to the Pentagon that afternoon, and he's back at the foot of my bed that night. And he didn't get Fitzsimmons, but he got Fort Carson, which is like 60 miles south of Denver. So he he said, I'll be up every weekend to get you out of here. So wow. he came up every weekend, unless he had duty, but he'd come up every weekend and get me out of the hospital. It's amazing. So, uh, that, 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 yeah. I mean, the, the friendship that you guys have is... Uh, I mean, you can just hear it, you know, like it, it, it's still oh, alive, yeah, it's it, still breathing, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, well, and then in August, he's telling me, he said, Murph, I'm getting an early out, end of October, I'm going back to help my dad bring in the crops, and he said, you're going back to South Dakota with me, and I, I said, I just had surgery, look at all these tubes. He said, you got about two and a half months to get rid of them tubes. He said, you tell your doctor on Monday, you're going back to Dakota with me, and and which I, which I did. And it was funny because in the end of October he didn't know and I didn't know how far I could ride because I only weighed um, only weighed about a hundred pounds and uh, and so uh, he drove he had a big 440 Dodge uh, Magnum uh, Charger and I think he d- he didn't drive under a hundred because uh, he wanted to make sure we could get back to South Dakota and then I'd be okay or get uh, yeah so he a yeah, very special. Uh, a special friend. When you tell him that you're not going to walk, what does he say to you? You know, and I don't even remember that, you know. And oh, I mean, did he know when he first saw you that you weren't going to be able to walk again? No, no, he didn't. I mean, just, that, that was the thing when he was probably scared as, uh, you know, you know I, I wouldn't say much, so he was nervous that I, that I was going into shock. And I said, no, I said, I just... I said that the, the two bullets that went through the right side. I said they're, I said they're painful, and to me, a burning, stinging thing uh, feeling. And uh, and I remember he ripped actually ripped two trees with his bare hands. About oh, I'm thinking they were what two three inches in diameter to make me a stretcher to carry. He sent another guy back to get a poncho uh, to carry. You know, to put me in to carry me. And. Uh, and I and I could tell he was scared or he was, you know, real concerned and and uh, you know and again neither one of us knew the, you know the the injuries uh, you know how bad the injuries would be, and and I've been fortunate I get up on uh, I used to get up a lot on the uh, leg braces and the Canadian sticks, mm-hmm. you know so I walked uh, I mean I walked some on them, you know lately I I don't I fell down about four years ago and and tore up my, I had three tears and a rotor cuff. So I really, I stay in the chair a lot more now. Gotcha. Uh, the, yeah, just a manual wheelchair. Just, uh, um, yeah, so I mean, uh, yeah, uh, you know, and you're thinking, boy, I mean, if they would have said, hey, and I love sports, um, that was the other thing. I, I always wanted to be a coach. And, um, and I guess after being wounded, I, I didn't want to, you know, I, I ended up going uh, to looking at business administration. I used to play a lot of uh, wheelchair sports, a lot of wheelchair basketball. And we had a team here in, in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. That was, they ranked uh, the 20 teams. They ranked, out of the 250 teams, they ranked the top 20. And we were probably ranked 10 years or better in the top 20. Wow. And, uh, and it was like four, uh, about six of the guys were Vietnam vets that, you know, either were spinal cord injury or, or lost, uh, you know, lost a limb, you know, lost a leg or, or lost. We got one guy that's lost both, uh, both, 
uh, lower extremities. So when you are back in the hospital and Lyle comes to see you for the first time, uh, when does he learn the extent of your injuries from your wounds? Well, he he earned. I mean, no, was right. I mean, I tell him right away. You know, um, you know, and that was in in June of '69 when he was home on leave, and yet. Uh, but but again, I you know I was alive, or that was the thing. I, my father would, uh, my folks would call me in uh, in Japan. I spent about eighteen days in the VAC hospital at the seventy first of VAC outside of Pleiku. They usually try to get you out within five days. Of the hot, you know, the out of Vietnam. Well, they couldn't stabilize me, so they actually had a doctor escort me out, and then he escorted me to. Uh, to um, Cameron Bay and then up to uh, up to Yokohama, Japan, 106 Army Hospital, and then I was at, I was there just a couple weeks in Japan, and they said, Murph, you're going to go home within 48 hours. Well, I got sick, and then I ended up having surgery again. So and then it was like I spent um, five weeks in in Japan at the 106 Yokohama, Japan, and then I ended up at Fitzsimmons and had surgery. Of course, there again also, uh, you know. So, and the thing is, I when when my folks would call me, my dad, the first thing when he would, uh, they'd call me every week in Japan, and the first thing is, have they weighed you yet? And uh, and how much do you weigh? And I said, well, I don't think they've weighed me yet. And he said, well, how much do you think you weigh? And and I said a hundred pounds, and I could tell that, you know, that he was real concerned. And I'd I'd always come back and say, I'm still alive. You know, so, because um, I actually ended up going down all, I weighed in at Fitzsimmons um, roughly two months after being shot up. I only weighed in at uh, 83 pounds. Wow. And, and and I weighed 165 when I went to Vietnam, and I just went on R&R, so I knew I weighed 135 when I was shot up. Um, and so, <laughs> hey, we can laugh about it, and we can say, life is good. <laughs> Uh, Mark. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm just curious, you know, what's it like when you get back to the States, you know, and, and you have to start to go through learning life as someone who's paralyzed? Well, again, at Fitzsimmons, you know, um, you know, I went to physical therapy twice a day. Uh, you know, I mean, just, but again, and like I told you before, in every hospital, there's, there's somebody a lot worse than, than Sergeant Murphy, you know? So, and, you know, I, I mean, I, I felt fortunate that I lived and I guess I always think uh, the good Lord let me live, but also Lyle Bowes helped me to live. So, so I look at that and it, um, and, and I was hesitant. I, I remember when they said, uh, cause I ended up in a, in a, a VA spinal cord injury center, a brand new one up in Milwaukee for about, um, I'm thinking from March to the end of June. And I was, uh, I, I was a kind of, um, concerned that they said, Hey, you're going to be dismissed. Cause I spent 14 months in different hospitals and you're in that setting where, uh, everything's taken care of. You know, I mean, you look at that and you think, you know, they didn't, you know, and now I know they put you out like an apartment where you've got to, you've got to fend for yourself. Well, I was a little apprehensive saying, hey, I'm going back to a little town of white South Dakota that, um, you know, that, you know, how am I, you know, what am I going to do the rest of my life? You know, would I, will I ever meet somebody that, that I will marry? Uh, they told me up front that we wouldn't, you know, that I wouldn't have kids, you know, and then we've been fortunate we have a daughter, um, you know, so I, I look at that and, yeah, that's why I always say, hey, you shouldn't worry about anything, because <laughs> hey, life is good. Um, so when you get back uh, and you finish all your rehab, I mean, the reception of Vietnam vets, and I've always asked this of a lot of them, was wildly different than the reception of veterans now. Um, uh -huh. what, what do you remember about that? Did you ever have any bad, you know, run-ins with anybody? Did people look at you differently? You know, I, I always think the ones, the, the Midwest, uh, rural communities treated people a lot better. I remember Bose brought me home uh, October of, 
of 69 on a 30-day convalescent leave. And that little town of White, which is 400 or 450, that first night home, 200 people uh, came up and welcomed me home. So I had a welcome home. And I also look at spending 14 months with other Vietnam veterans. I had my, uh, I call it my downtime or my diffusing, you know, where, you know, you were with your brothers and sisters, you know, so you had that, um, you know, and, and I don't remember anybody protesting, you know, in the little town of White. I mean, because, like I said, there was, um, I'm thinking there was close to 60 uh, guys and gals that were in the military at that time, and 38 of them actually went to Vietnam. And I know when when I came home for good in, in June of, of 70, there was uh, actually six other Vietnam vets returned to that little community. And my father said, uh, you know, you can use my house any time. I know you're probably going to drink. You're probably going to uh, uh, do different things that you probably shouldn't be doing. But he said, you can use my home, um, you know, and it was nothing to be up there on Friday, Saturday, and Sundays from playing playing cards to watching different sporting events. And uh, and he was one that invited, uh, you know, invited the veterans in. Um, and, uh, you know, which I, I guess I look back and I thank him for that, you know, because, again, uh, and we hung out. We had a little pool hall there, so we'd go down there and play cards and have a few beers. But, um, you know, we weren't rowdy by any means. Um, you know, I, I uh, before going, I liked to hunt pheasants and ducks, and I don't. if it wasn't for uh, a couple of my brothers, I probably wouldn't hunt at all. And and because I remember coming home, and in the fall of the year we'd always hunt pheasants together, and and of course one of my brothers said, "Get your shotgun clean because we're going hunting." And I said, "I don't know if I want to," and he said, "Well, you better get it clean because you're going you're going with us." And also, um, yeah, so the different things and you know how you're treated, and I guess I think I was treated very uh, very special by the people in my hometown. Let me ask you in reference to you talked before about, you know, the government and being upset with them. Um, have you been to the wall uh, in Washington, D.C.? And what does it do for you? And have your feelings changed at all when you look back on the Vietnam experience from a political aspect? Well, you know, and, and, and I've seen the wall, boy, just about, I mean, every year because I get to D.C. about uh, three times a year. So usually one of the trips is a special trip to the wall. Um, the first time I went um, was hard, and I actually went with two other uh, Vietnam vets, and and uh, and I read a couple of the um, a couple of the items that were left behind, and and I knew I had to get get away from the wall. Um, we went out like when they dedicated the three infantry. Uh, there was, again, my buddy Lyle Bowes and two other Vietnam vets went out to that dedication. Um, you know, uh, you know, I mean, the wall, I think, is special. Um, you know, and I've got different pictures in my office, uh, of like the three infantry men, um, um, picture of the battle in the Drang Valley, uh, uh, with the movie, we were young and soldiers. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just because we were in I Drang, but we were in there in about '68. The, the movie happened when they did the movie. That was uh, the in '65. They said, um, but the wall is special because again, uh, to me, it um, it helps heal. You know, and, and you should never forget. Uh, I guess never forget the warriors and what they gave. I mean. I always say freedom is never free. Somebody has to pay a price. And these individuals, to me, wrote, and and you've heard that comment before, they wrote a blank check to the U.S., the United States of America, that they would do anything and everything and give their life for America, for these freedoms. So, uh, you know, at times I'm thinking that uh, the, the younger generation know what, 
you know, what uh, what these World War II vets and these Korean vets went through. Right. And, of course, the Vietnam now and then, you know, the Iraqi Afghanistan. Uh, you know, that's why I don't, I don't like to glorify war. I think war is ugly, and sometimes I think we should send the politicians first. <laughs> <laughs> They'd certainly we have a different perspective, have right. Wars. Right. I mean, just, <laughs> Yeah, because I, uh, you know, and it's and it's the young people that go to wars. Gene, you said when you went to the wall the first time, you know, you had to leave after seeing some stuff. What sort of emotions were you feeling then? Oh, I was feeling. Um, I guess I was feeling real sad. Uh, you know, because I, because again, I, uh, you know, I looked up two of my buddies, and you know, and then what they went through, and and what they gave, and you think. You know, does really America, uh, does America and American people really know, you know, what that individual gave for us to be free? You know, uh, you look you look back and, um, you know, these individuals again, you know, they went through hell and uh, and they were still ready, I mean, willing and, and to give their lives. And, and that's really... Uh, you know, that's hard, I think. In 1987, you became the National Commander of the Disabled American Veterans, DAV. Um, how does that come about, and what you know, what kind of honor was that for you? Well, 1987, and I ran the first time in 1983 for national office. I went through the, the chairs of our local chapter here in Sioux Falls, and I went through the uh, state chairs uh, for the Department of South Dakota. I mean, I felt real honored to even, you know, to uh, to be recommended uh, to go through the chairs by the group here in South Dakota, of course, and then uh, to go in and, and go up through the chairs and become the national commander in 87. Now, we're a small department. We're 5,000 members with roughly uh, nine chapters now. Um, you know, so I was very honored, very humbled. That, you know that boy. I was going to be the national commander and and speak on behalf of right now 1.3 million members. Uh, we weren't quite that then, but we were. I think we were around that uh, probably that 850,000 members. Uh, but but again, and I, you know, I testified before Congress. I was. I always said I was a goodwill ambassador for the disabled American veterans. And and I was used, you know, prior to my becoming the national commander, and I've been used after being the national commander. Um, I guess I think that disabled American veterans is the best of the best, you know. Um, and I'm a member of of like probably uh, seven other veterans organizations, but but again, my heart lies and and my work lies with the disabled American veterans. I just. I think they put their money where their mouth is. Um, I look at the, the different programs that they have for veterans. Uh, you know, I look at our national service program where we have roughly around 290 national service officers that help file uh, benefits for veterans, you know, is second to none. I mean, we're, we're top. Uh, we've got a transportation program that, that we actually started in uh, uh I was involved in 1984. We started it in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and then in 1987, it went throughout the nation. And that's to transport any veteran that has an appointment to the VA. Um, we get volunteer drivers, and sometimes they drive their own vehicles. But like in South Dakota, we have 27 vans on the road that transport veterans into the VA hospitals and the clinics. You know, we have the, the employment program, uh, to, you know, to help uh, veterans with, you know, write up a resume, uh, get job interviews, and, and get and get jobs. Uh, uh, we have the local veterans assistance program uh, where, where, again, we try to help uh, that average veteran that says he's an older, he or she's an older veteran that needs uh, their leaves rakes. They need to go to the uh, uh, grocery store. Um, and so on. I mean, I, I guess I look at our programs, and and we're the top. I mean, yet, uh, and and I guess I look at our leadership, and uh, you know, they we have a, a strong core of um, of our leaders on the top level. 
but again, it's that rank and file. I call them the blue hats. You know, that that veteran that um, uh, helps out every day. I know even myself now I've helped. I mean, I've ran the department for about 45 years. And again, I'm trying to retire and uh, but still be involved to a point. But uh, but again, the, the DAV is the best of the best. To that end, um, we'll finish on this note. Uh, obviously, your friendship with Lyle is still going on. Uh, how often do you guys see each other? And um, is every day with him something different and exciting still? I mean, how lucky do you guys feel that you're still together? Oh, yeah, because I was just up. He had a big party. <laughs> he had a Bose's bash on Saturday, so my wife and myself went up. And uh, and we probably see each other, um, I'm thinking um, – probably a couple times a month or we talk on the phone, uh, you know, cause he's only 50 miles from me. So, I mean, that's, uh, and we just, matter of fact, we just came out with a, a book, a professor down at the university of South Dakota did a book called Vietnam vets still coming home. And he was going to interview just six Vietnam vets and get the book out quickly. And after nine years and in interviewing 31 Vietnam vets, and then there was a there was a committee of six of us. We had to raise thirty five thousand to get the first thousand books printed, and we did that. And both Lyle and myself were a chapter in the book. And it was kind of uh, we we're told about the Vietnam vet prior to you know I guess prior to going to Vietnam, his service in Vietnam, and what he's what uh, what's going on now after Vietnam. Gene, it's been amazing. I think that. Your story, not only your individual story, but your connection with Lyle and other vets and what you were able to accomplish as the commander of the Disabled American Veterans has left an indelible impact on veterans across the country. And certainly, uh, I I appreciate all your honesty and your candor and your willingness to talk to us. But uh, what I appreciate even more is your amazing outlook after all these years, how lucky and how blessed you are, despite the fact that you've been paralyzed, despite the fact that you've had all these experiences that nobody would want or ever sign up for, but you know, you still got a smile on your face and you're, you're humble and certainly cognizant of the fact that uh, Gene Murphy's life is pretty darn good. I think that's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you. You ever get to South Dakota, look us up. <laughs> but again, life is good, young fella. <laughs> and you're, you're one of the young whippersnappers that we spend. And I look at, I look at the future and we still have a lot to do a lot of work ahead of us, especially, again, with the younger veterans that are coming back with, again, the TBI or traumatic brain injury, again, the post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD. Um, You know, and I know the VA says about 20%, and I think it's probably double that. Um, So so I get concerned on, you know, how we're treating our younger veterans. Uh, I look at our female veterans, and we've got a long road to go there even, so... An amazing point. Gene Murphy, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And certainly thank you for being part of the Hazard Ground. Okay. Thank you, Mark. Take care. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.